And welcome to my full CapCut tutorial for beginner. I've made a couple of CapCut tutorials already, but not a complete course. This is aimed at the total beginner, so if you've never used it, this video might be for you. I'm going to separate everything in chapters, so if you know something you can skip ahead. Just check the video description if you want to see what's inside of this course. It's obviously free, and good news is that CapCut itself is free as well. There are some pro features though. The price depends on when you watch this video, but even if you buy the Pro feature, it's not as expensive as Premiere Pro. The main reason is that CapCut doesn't have as many features and capabilities as Premiere Pro, but you can use this program, I would say for 95, maybe even 99% of what you want to do on social media. When it comes to music video production, it's not the best. I would advise you to look into Premiere Pro, especially when you want to make money as a video editor, music video editor, something like this. But when you're just a content creator, no problem using CapCut. It will do in 99% of the cases. And as I've said, it's free in its basic form. You don't even need the pro features for most stuff. You can find it at CapCut.com. I'm going to link to it in the video description. You don't even have to sign up here, but you can sign up as it's connected to TikTok with your TikTok account if you want to do that. It's going to give you a little bit of extra storage if you do that. So you can store your projects then in the cloud. There are two versions always available for mobile and desktop. And we want to use the desktop version. I have a Windows system, so this is not for Mac, this is for Windows. But for Mac, most of the stuff works the same way. On the official homepage, you can also find free templates. So if you want to have kind of like a presentation, you have kind of something specific in mind, browse through these templates. But on a download, there's the link that you need. As I've said, there is one for mobile. This tutorial is not about using it on mobile devices. It's for desktop devices, in my case, Windows. So click on this, download it, and use the installer. And after that is done, you can start the application. One thing to add though, we want to do it all in English. As most people understand English, at least to some degree, you can set the language down here before downloading it. It should give you the English version then. But even after you've downloaded it and it's not in English, we can fix that easily. I have already installed it and let me start it. And this is the first window that you're going to see then. Here yet again, I'm not signed in. I'm using the free version for this tutorial, so I can join Pro here. And if you left click on it, as I've said, you can use, for example, your TikTok account to sign in. But let's leave that aside. I will check this little gear icon at the top. Right here. And there you can see the current version. So this course uses version 3.5. And here in this box, you can always check for updates. As I'm making this video, this is the most recent version of CapCut. When there's a huge change, I'm going to make a new video about it. So I'm going to make videos about new features when they drop in new versions. But for the most part, even if you're now at version 4, it should look somewhat the same. So don't worry too much about that. But when you've got it installed, it makes sense to check for updates here and there. Here you can see most recent version, the latest version is installed. Under the gear icon, you can also see the settings. Left click on it and here you can set the language. For me, it is already English, but if you've downloaded it and it's in a different language, check this and set it to English as this tutorial will use that. When it comes to performance, just make sure that the first two are checked, but they should be by default. And when you're a beginner, don't mess too much with this. Just leave everything aside for now. We want to do some editing and not get lost in the little details. That's more for intermediate users. Just make sure that you've got English selected, save it, and then we're ready to go. To do that, we need a project. And when you start out, there is none. So we'll have to click on new project up here. And then a real window, a real CapCut window will open up. Yet again, we have the settings on the menu. It looks exactly the same. So here we have the language, for example, again. One more thing to add, we want to use the default layout. So make sure that this is active so that everything looks the way it does on your computer screen as it does in my tutorial. Whenever I use a different layout, I'm going to mention that specifically. And last thing to set up correctly are the shortcuts. 
these are the short keys shortcuts by default it should be set to shortcut one if it isn't make sure that yours is because that's what we're going to use for our tutorial all right let us dive into using CapCut. first thing that we want to do is to import something this is done under media here we can add footage on the local import you can click on the big plus sign and then your folders will open another way to do it is to drag and drop it into this window so if you have it for example here in my download folder i can left click drag and then drop it here this would be a simple time lapse i can also drop it into this box below which is the timeline but let us drop it into the media import menu One more option is to go to menu file and there's an import but easiest is always to drop it let's delete this by simply pressing the delete key when it is highlighted you can also simply select two or multiple files and then drag and drop them here and you've got them all in your box you can drag them from there on into the timeline or click on the plus sign and then they will appear in the timeline just like this Let me delete them yet again using the delete key. When you left click on them in your import box, they're going to appear in the preview window, but they're not in the timeline. So we're not actually using this clip, it's just a preview. It's only when you click on a plus sign and have it in the timeline, then we're working on it and it is at the same time visible in your preview window. So far so good. You may be asking yourself, but where do I actually find footage to use? Where I like to go is a website called Pexels. It's a German website, but I've never had any copyright issues. This is why I use it. You know this story is in English. I'm going to link to it in the video description below and don't be afraid to use it. Even if you don't know German, it's fairly simple. Just type in what you search for then left click on a clip and there you can download it. At the bottom it says you can use it for free. And as I've said, I've never had any copyright issues using clips from Pexels. Therefore, I'm going to use it for this tutorial as well, for this entire course. If you know a better English site, then use it. You don't have to use this one. And for the most part, you don't have to use the exact clips that I'm using. They're just examples to show you the functions of CapCut. Let us go back. You may have also noticed that on the media, there are more options. For example, the library. And here we have inbuilt functions. So this is CapCut specific stuff. You have a search bar to search for certain things. And let me just pick people. And you can left click on one, it's going to get downloaded. And then you can use it just like a regular video clip that you import. This inbuilt stuff is not that bad. And if you use it on TikTok, you will definitely not run into any copyright issues. Be careful though when you use it on YouTube. Especially when it comes to music, there is music, it's totally fine on TikTok. But when you use it on YouTube, you're going to get a copyright strike pretty quickly. But for practicing and this tutorial, you can use the inbuilt stuff as well if you don't want to use external stuff, for example from Pexels. Library is pretty fine. Here are green screen options for intro, outro. And we also have animated buttons, for example if I use subscribe. I press enter and now we can download these subscribe buttons and let me use a white one and you can see this animated it's a simple clip click on the plus sign and it's in your timeline these are the two options that we want to focus on there are more but you have to be signed in for brand assets also for spaces And there is a newly added AI generated option where you can prompt stuff. It's currently free. Hard to tell if it's going to stay that way. Usually they're going to charge money at some point for this AI stuff when they have trained their models. As this is a beginner tutorial, I don't want to focus on this. We are going to talk about the basics of using CapCut and not the AI in the background. So we're going to stick to local and import our own clips or we're going to use stuff from the library. Get yourself familiar with this. So for practice purposes, I would recommend that you import some clips of your own. 
download them from somewhere, maybe pixels, and drag and drop them into CapCut or use this plus icon. I have it under downloads. I double click and it's imported. All I've said, simply drag and drop right here. Now it was the other one. Now we've got it in our media folder and then you can drag and drop it into the timeline. Make sure that you've done that at least once and check out the library, download a clip, import it as well into your timeline and then we're ready to go to the next chapter. You may have wondered, there is an audio function right here, but it's not for importing audio. If you want to import media in general, so also audio, always use the media button. It is for videos, audio and photos. So we have a clip right here in MP4 from Pexels. We can import it and in the same window, we can also import an image, a JPG file, and you can drag both of that into your timeline. And here's an MP3, so audio clips work the same way. One thing is different though in the timeline, you can see there are different icons now. So audio files get a different channel, and which is an audio channel, as the video files which have a video channel. And you can see that this visibility for show and high track is gone for the audio clip as it doesn't have any visible features. For this tutorial, I'm using photos whenever I use photos from a website called Unsplash. I'm going to link to it in the video description as well. You can use these for free. On YouTube, I've never had any copyright issues. So it's a good place to check out if you are in search of free photos to use, even in your commercial videos, commercial projects. Let us get back to our timeline. You can click on this plus sign multiple times. And in my case, the photo will be added multiple times. Left click select and then press the E key to get rid of it. You can also left click drag. And now a new video channel was opened for the photo. And this works like a layer menu. You may have seen that when you're used to using Photoshop or GIMP. CapCut works the same way. It stacks these elements on top of one another. So the one that's above is visible and the one below is still there, but it's hidden because the other one is stacked on top. You can always left click drag and inverse the order like this. So now the footage is on top of the photo. And let me drag that down because this video channel was empty. You can also left click drag on these edges to readjust the duration. So make it shorter or longer. In essence, the X dimension here in this timeline is the duration and the Y dimension is the layer order. My stuff snaps because I've got the snapping turned on right here. N would be the short key for it. If you have that turned off, it won't snap. So for the most part, you want to have that active. Make sure it's highlighted. If it isn't, left click on it. Snapping also works for audio clips. So I can reposition this to the end. It also works for the marker. So I drag this right here and now my elements snap to the marker and I can resize that accordingly. Having snapping turned on is really helpful. Only in rare case, you want to have it turned off. So make sure that this is highlighted. We can also use text in CapCut. There's a text option, add text defaults, click on the plus sign to add it to your timeline. And it's comparable elements to photos and clips and footage. So you get an element that's stackable in this layer menu. You could say this timeline, whenever you add something, don't worry too much about the text. We're going to go over this in detail in a future chapter. You can, for example, change the color to red right here. Give it a different style or case. And there are even some preset styles. Again, the layer order defines if something is visible. Now, for example, our clip is on top of the text, so we can't see it anymore, but it's still there. So if I drag this left click drag in the preview window, you can see it again. Two shortcuts to learn are A and B. A is for the select tool and B for the split tool. You're going to have to switch between these two 
a lot when you do video editing in CapCut. So it's a good idea to directly memorize them. A and B, A for select, B for split. And the split tool is basically a cut tool that allows you to cut elements in your timeline and A allows you to select them, drag them around. So now A, the select tool is active. I press B, the cursor changes. I left click and now this is cut. I switch back to A and I can drag it around. Same goes for audio, B for the split tool, A for select, I delete this. Again, B for the split tool, I cut it, A for the select tool, I delete. Don't worry too much about the other options for now right here. The only one that's directly interesting is the undo. It's the typical short key control Z. So with control Z, you get one step back in your user history and the current project. But I think that's easily to memorize as that's the same for almost every program. You can also left click drag in your timeline to select multiple objects and then reposition them all at once. For example like this. You can scroll up and down so if you have multiple layers that you can't see because you've stacked so many just scroll with your mouse wheel. Free to practice, let us start clean, so press Ctrl A to select it all and then press the delete key. Make sure to go to Unsplash and download a photo, then go to Pexels, download some footage, I've used this one from LA. And then add an audio clip, I've used one from the YouTube audio library, so it's free to use as well, but any will do. Now we'll add all of this to our timeline, just like this, click on the plus signs, footage first, photo second, add your audio clip, this is where we start. We also need a text element, let us resize it directly, snapping is enabled, and we'll change the text to tutorial. We can do that up here as long as the text element is highlighted in the timeline, if it isn't left click on it. We use select and split, A and B, go to this position, the start, move to 5 seconds and this indicator right here. In my case it's 5 and then 26 and this means 5 seconds and 26 frames. We want to have exactly 5 seconds and 0 frames, therefore we'll use the arrow keys to the left. And if you use them one by one, you'll get there frame by frame. You could also use them to the right, which would move you forward frame by frame. Make sure that you are at 500, then press B for the split tool and cut your footage. Delete the excess footage that comes after it. And then you want to have 5 seconds of photo so that we have 10 seconds in total. Snapping is enabled and I drag my text element to the position so that it covers both of these clips in the video channels, my footage and the photo, but nothing more. I only want to have audio where the photo starts, so B, the split tool is active, I go down, at this position, left click to cut it, then I go to the end, left click again to cut it, I press A for the select tool and delete the excess parts. So what we have now is, we have our text on top of the footage and the photo, and the music starts when the footage is done and the photo is visible. I haven't connected my audio interface, but you can see right here, audio is playing, you should have that yourself. Make sure to actually do that to understand how the timeline works and to play around with these functions in CapCut. Let us go over the basic edit functions for videos. We'll put some footage into our timeline. It already runs in the preview window right here when I click on the play button. Let me pause it and go back to the start. And here on the right hand side you can see a couple of options. But if I deselect this clip in the timeline they're gone. Let me select it again and they're back. So CapCut automatically detects what is being highlighted in the timeline and then it gives you certain options depending on what element that is. In our case, a video clip. For audio you have different elements, for text you have different elements. But let us for now stick to video editing. On the video basic we have a couple of options that are easily explainable and very intuitive. For example the scaling. This makes your footage bigger or smaller. But keep in mind this is not cropping. 
So you scale it down and all of a sudden you see these black bars on top and on the sides. So the original aspect ratio is kept. In our case that was 16 by 9. If I click here, origin is checked. So scaling makes the element smaller but not your project. Project itself remains 16 by 9 with its original size. And this is where you can see these black bars now. You can even scale your clips above the original size up to 500% in this case. Keep in mind that depending on the resolution of your clips this is going to make it blurry. So you don't want to scale too much, especially not when you have a low resolution. But in most cases you can easily get away with using 120, 150, sometimes even 200%. In our case let me make that 113. And now I can left click drag and reposition this clip. So that way we've basically cut out a portion on the left hand side. And just in case you're wondering, this bounding box will disappear when you deselect your clip in the timeline. So if I play it again, we don't see it anymore. And the part that was on the left is now outside of the frame. So when we would export this, we wouldn't have it anymore in our final result. One more thing to add, scaling looks like zooming in and out, but it's technically not zooming. Zooming is done with the camera and this adjusts the resolution while you zoom. And it's not happening while you scale things up, but this is just a technicality. I simply wanted to add this because some people might have the question on how to zoom. And if you want to zoom in post, so after you've shut your clip, this is done via scaling. All right, let's get back to 100%. I reposition it to center. And now we'll go to something called rotate right here. You can actually rotate your clips in three different ways in CapCut. Here you could do it numerically, but there's also an icon up here. If you left click on it, it rotates in 90 degree increments. So 0, 90, 180, 270 and 360 for a full rotation. The option to do it numerically or here using these arrows allows you to rotate it in between. And there's also the circle. Finally, you can left click drag here on this little rotate icon in the preview window and do that manually. For the most part, this is what you want or I think this is what is easiest and most intuitive. If you don't have a fixed value in mind, just use this icon. What you can now see is we have the black bars again, especially on top left and bottom right. So here it makes sense to scale it up until the bounding box exceeds our original size and all the black bars are gone. Let me play it again and now it looks like this is the original footage and it's rotate. Let's go back to the starting point yet again. And we'll move to the next option which is an option for mirroring. So watch the mountains in background. If we mirror stuff this is going to basically get flipped so the mountain in the background is now on the right hand side and not on the left anymore if I mirror this. All of this also works on other elements, for example a text element. But we'll have to do some stuff a little bit different. You can see if I select this we have different tool options here, way less. And we also have different options on the right hand side as we don't have a video anymore. We have a text element detected by CapCut. But if you scroll down here is the scaling again and below it the rotation. So this remains the same. But what is totally missing is the option to mirror. To mirror a text you actually have to convert it first to a video. And this is always done in CapCut via turning it into a compound clip. To do that we'll right click on the elements, in our case the text, and then it says create compound clip, all G would be the short key. Left click on it and you can already see how the element has changed in the timeline. And now if that is selected we can see we now have a video and our mirror option is back. So we can mirror now this text because we've turned it into a video clip. We will have to use compound clips a couple of times in future chapters. It's going to become a second nature to use that. 
But for you to practice in this chapter, I want you to import a video clip, pick whatever you like, then rotate it, make it minus 10. and then scale it up until the black bars are gone on the sides. In my case, I need to use 130. Or let me even go to 140. We can be sure that they're definitely gone. Once that is done, I want you to mirror it. Check your final results. Everything should be good. No black bars, fully mirrored, a little bit rotated. Now I want you to add a text element, a default text is fine, resize it to have it as long as your footage, change it to tutorial, place it up here with a left click drag, scroll down, adjust rotation right here, make it minus 15, play it again to make sure that you can see it for the entire duration. Go somewhat to the mid position of the duration, then add another default text, make it as long as your footage in the end. Change this text to mirror, make it red. Rotate it to minus 15 once more. Then right click on it, create a compound clip and mirror it. So it should now have the other angle and it should be red like in a mirror, so backwards. And this should be your final result. Make sure to do that so that you have some practice on your hands and then come back for the next chapter. Let us talk about the aspect ratio. Um, the best way to show that is to turn vertical into horizontal and horizontal into vertical videos. Vertical would be this one, for example. Horizontal this one. Usually horizontal is shut in 16 by 9 and vertical 9 by 16. You can see that here we have a horizontal and then a vertical, but the vertical has these black bars on the sides. And if we delete that and we put the vertical first and then the horizontal, you can also see black bars, but now they are on top and bottom. And this shows you that CapCut uses the first aspect ratio or the aspect ratio of the first element that you put into your timeline. And then every element that comes after it just gets this aspect ratio for the project. If you want to adjust it manually, you can do that here where it says ratio. Just left click on it. There are a couple of options. In our case, this is the vertical shot. Original is checked because it takes the original aspect ratio. We could also set it to 9 by 16. Nothing would change. Don't get confused by this. You can customize your project settings. So there are more options. When you're a beginner, I would just advise you to leave that alone. More important are the default aspect ratios that we can choose here. We can, as I've said, turn this vertical into a horizontal by selecting 16 by 9. We have the black bars to the sides, left and right. We now need to select our clip in the timeline and then scale it up until we can't see the black bars anymore and drag it down. And if we now export this clip, it would be 16 by 9 horizontal. So this would be the typical YouTube video. If you return to vertical, the original aspect ratio, you have to reset the scale and the position. So in most cases, it's easiest to just delete this clip in the timeline and import it again so that it gets its default values. Same way works for these horizontal shots. It's 16 by 9 by default. And if we turn that into 9 by 16, for example, for TikTok, we need to select it, scale it up, and then we may have to reposition that a little bit. And then we would be through. There are other aspect ratios, but for the most part you don't need them, especially not for social media. Just stick to 9 by 16 and 16 by 9. And as I've said, here's a customization option, but this for the entire project. And here you can, for example, also set the aspect ratio and the ratio. 
but we'll stick to what we've got here. As I said, delete it, import it again. And there you go, we have it in its original size and scale. This one right here is a zoom option, so it is not for the aspect ratio. You can just zoom into your clip and then move around, but be careful when you try to move beyond its borders, it's going to reposition the clip. So always check for black bars after zooming. And here is for full screen. If you want to check your clip on a full screen. What I want you to do is find yourself a horizontal and a vertical clip like I did here and then try to invert them. Here we have the horizontal. Once again, we'll flip it to 9 by 16 to turn it into a vertical shot. We have to scale it up and we may have to reposition it. Play it to make sure that there are no black bars anywhere. Do the same for your vertical clip. You need to switch it to 16 by 9. Then scale it up, reposition it. Play it and check for black bars or any problems. Once you've got that done, you're ready for the next chapter. Let us talk about a second way to adjust the aspect ratio, at least to some degree. It's cropping. Cropping isn't technically there to adjust the aspect ratio, but it works kind of the same way in CapCut. For example, here, this image, let's just say we wanted the guy to end somewhat in center. It's a 16 by 9 clip and he's way too far to the left. So we want him to walk more to the middle. We're able to access the crop tool. We need to select our clip in a timeline. This is going to give us more options in this top toolbox. And here is the crop ratio. Left click on it. Here the slider is for the time. So you can scroll through the entire clip. And then with the left click drag, you can adjust this box. And by default, it's set to free. Or we can use 16 by nine here. And if we adjust it now, it keeps the aspect ratio for this cropping window. Let's just put it here and if you want him to end exactly in center, it's going to be a very small clip. By the way, you can also rotate it. We don't want that in this case. We'll just confirm. One problem that cropping might create is that we now have a very blurry result. It's because of the resolution of the original. So we've successfully cropped it so that the guy ends in center. But for this specific clip, it created this blurriness because CapCut had zoomed or technically scaled this clip way too far up. Let us still stick to 16 by 9, but we'll make it a bit bigger. Something like this maybe. I confirm again, and now we could get away with it. So now the zoom level isn't that hard on our resolution, therefore we could use it. With this example, you've already seen that this is basically nothing but a scale and repositioning, but it does that a little bit more intuitively, I would say. By the way, before I forget, you can reset everything to the original by using this button right here and then confirm it. And here you can see if I do it manually, I scale it up and then reposition it. That's the same effect. And if we scale up a lot, we'll get the blurriness back because of the resolution. So this is manually what the cropping does. Why should you use it? Well, it's much quicker than doing it by hand. Let me show you this on a vertical example. And let's say we wanted to convert this into a horizontal video, like we did in the last chapter. Instead of doing it by hand, we'll simply select the cropping option and we'll set this to 16 by 9.
position it on the coffee mug up to this position. We'll confirm. And then all that we have to do is to set the ratio to 16 by 9, like this. We don't have any black bars anywhere. And I think that this is much quicker than, than doing it manually. For you to practice, pick yourself a clip like this and try to readjust the composition via cropping. So maybe something on the side on the left should be in center or the other way around. I'll leave it up to you. Then pick a vertical clip and turn it into a horizontal using this method that I've just shown you. And finally use a horizontal and make it vertical. Let us go over this once more. I'll just use this. It was 16 by 9. We want to have it for TikTok. What we do is we crop it right here. We pick a 9 by 16 for the crop ratio. Position it up to here and then confirm. And finally, to get rid of the black bars, we'll set the ratio to 9 by 16 as well. Play the clip and check if everything is fine. In my case, it is. Make sure to actually do that to get some practice into your hands and then come back for the next chapter. Let's talk a little bit about adding audio to your footage. The typical case, the typical situation when you create online content is that you have your footage, maybe some music, a voiceover. And here you can see this clip doesn't have audio, so it's totally blank. This little volume indicator, you could say. So when I play the clip, we can't see anything. Let me delete it. We also have a clip where this is not the case. If I play it, the audio indicator is now greenish, even a little bit orange, because there is audio inbuilt into this clip. Even though it's not separately on an audio channel, we can access this by selecting the element and at the bottom you can see it and I can hover over it, the cursor changes and I left click drag and this adjusts the volume. Yet again, on this clip we didn't have that, I could adjust something but there is none, so nothing would get adjusted. You also notice that right here under audio we can now find it. So here's our adjustment for volume already indicated and we can do that using the slider we could also do that for the other one even though it doesn't have audio. So this option is always there in CapCut as long as it's video footage. Here's also the fader. So if you've been searching for a solution to fade audio in and out, it's right here. We also have a couple of boxes, but these are mostly for voiceovers. So when you have a song, you don't really have to mess with it. But when you use a voiceover, it makes sense to add a loudness normalization and the noise reduction. Don't worry too much about the pro features. You don't actually need them in most cases. You also have voice changers. I'm going to talk about that later on. But let us get back to our timeline. Here was our clip that has audio. Now we can right click on it and then use extract audio to actually have that visible in an audio channel. And now you could reposition that, edit it, cut it without affecting the video footage. Let's get back to our start position. As I've said, usually you'll have some footage and you don't want to use the audio in it. Instead, you have a voiceover, or want to add music, something like this. So we'll have it separately. Here is, for example, a music clip from YouTube's audio library. If you click on a plus sign, you have it in a separate audio channel. We can still use the split tool on it, B and the select tool, A. Or we can now directly go to audio adjustments looks the same way as before. It just doesn't say video or audio anymore on top. We are directly in basic. Or we can add our fades here and adjust the volume. Let me reselect this here. And the fade, it detects automatically the end of this element and then adds it. So it's not the end of the music clip. It's the end of this element in the timeline wherever you've used the split, even if it's in the middle of a song. Here's a voiceover from one of my earlier videos, from one of my YouTube videos. It works the same way. So here we have volume, fade in. You usually don't want to use a fade on voiceovers. 
but it may make sense to adjust the volume a little bit and then check the boxes for loudness normalization and noise reduction. That's not a bad idea in most cases. What my projects look like is I always use a little bit of music in the start. So I drag this music clip down here to a separate audio channel. I use the split tool, delete the excess part, but I usually like to use stuff from the center and then I fade it in and out. I reduce the volume so that you can hear my voice and at the start I don't want to have me speaking too much so I drag this a little bit further to the right and here in sensor I don't want to have music so I simply delete this. And now I add a fade in here as well and a fade out at the start once more. And this is usually what my projects look like when I make YouTube videos. If you don't want to use the YouTube audio library, there is an inbuilt audio library in CapCut for TikTok videos that's totally fine. But a word of caution is, just because these audio clips can be used on TikTok, it doesn't mean that YouTube will not strike you for that with a copyright claim. So be very, very careful with using these songs outside of TikTok. I would recommend staying away from that entirely. If you want to use your videos on YouTube, use stuff from YouTube's audio library. This is usually copyright free and it can be also used on different social media platforms than YouTube. I've never had problems with it so far. But I've had problems using TikTok or this CapCut music on YouTube, so be careful. But in principle, you can pick by category or just type in a song name if you've got something specific in mind. Let's just use an R&B song. If you found something that you like, just click on this download button. If you left click on it, you can hear a little bit of it. Download it when you like it at the element via the plus icon. I'm going to delete my music here. And then you've got it right here as an element, just like we had before. So there is no difference between using that and external music when it comes to the functionality. One more thing to add is there is a copyright checker inbuilt in CapCut. You'll find it right here. You can simply confirm via check, but your clip needs to be at least one minute long. So let me delete this right here and I add the original yet again. I don't split it, I keep its length around three minutes. And there you go, it works. Sometimes it hangs itself up, maybe service overloaded or whatever is happening in the background. So you may have to run that a couple of times. In this case, I know it's going to work because I know it's music from CapCut itself and they all run on TikTok without any copyright issues. You can also do that for external stuff. So let me run this one from the YouTube audio library and this also works. Yet again, a word of caution, this only checks for copyright issues or copyright claims on TikTok. So if it goes through this checker, it doesn't mean that it's going to work on YouTube or on other social media. So yet again, use your CapCut music only on TikTok and not anywhere else. Just my suggestion from experience and getting a copyright claim. Let us get back. What I want you to do for practice is to add a video file then add some music. I want you to fade it in and out. Use the split tool B to cut it. Let me import this one yet again. It had an audio clip. We can recover this here, but the extract is gone because we've extracted it earlier and here you can see it. Make 
make sure to find a clip that has audio as well and then extract it once to see how that works. You can delete it and then right click on it and recover it. It's going to be in the video footage again. Do that just to practice it. And then also pick yourself some music that's inbuilt in CapCut. Download it, add it to your footage, use the split tool. And here again, use a fade in and fade out to practice that and go down with the volume. Once you're done, come back for the next chapter. Next up, let us talk a little bit more in detail about compound clips. Let us assume we've got some footage and we want to put a logo on it. Usually that's somewhere in a corner, maybe top right. Let me put it there. Now we want to add an effect. And the easiest way to add an effect to all clips involved is to left click, drag, select them all, right click, create a compound clip. Or G is the short key for it. And this is comparable to a nested clip or a nested element in Premiere Pro if you're used to using that. So everything that was selected is now part of this one element in the timeline. In our case, that was just the logo, the image and the footage. And now if we add an effect, it's going to be applied to this compound clip, which means that all elements inside get this effect. If I, for example, add a fade in, you can see that it fades in the entire clip. Same would go for all other animations. Let us pick, for example, this one right here, a swing. And you can see how the logo and the footage is affected by it. You can always right click and then undo compound clip, which is basically unnesting, detaching all of these elements and we'll get back our two clips. And if you add an effect now, you have to add it to these elements one by one. In this case, we've got a black logo on a black fade. So a different effect would exemplify that a little bit better. Let me, for example, use one of these here. Maybe the last one, the puzzle effect. I'll download this and I add it. And you can see it's only the footage that's affected. Well, the logo stays the way it was. But if I now select this all, right click, create, compound clip, animation, in, I scroll down to puzzle. And now not only the footage, but also the logo is animated via this simple puzzle in effect. And this is the difference between these two options. So treating these elements one by one, each individually, specifically, or nesting them in a compound clip and then applying these effects to the compound clip. Same goes for audio clips. So you can also nest them in a compound clip. So let me add one here. Use the split tool B to shorten it a little bit. I select it all, right click, create compound clip. Now you can also see that there is an audio involved by this wavelength diagram below in the footage element. We could extract the audio now or we can right click and undo compound clip and this would bring back all of these elements. One more thing to add, there's also a group function. So you can group elements, right click here again, use group and the short key for this would be all G, but grouping them wouldn't put them in the same, I don't want to call it group now. But in the same element, you can see that this is just connected. So if you deselect that and you want to drag only one element out of this group, it won't work. So these are now connected in the timeline. You can ungroup that and now they're detached from one another. But that's a different thing compared to a compound clip. As you can see, the compound clip is the nesting element, the element that nests all of the ones that are part of it and the group just connects them. So for the most part, what you want is a compound clip and not a group. What I want you to do for practice is pick yourself some footage and an image, maybe a logo if you can find one, some audio footage, put it in your timeline and then create your own compound clip and an in animation. I want you to pick the puzzle effect in my version. That's the last in animation available.
and then go to out and here let me check we don't want to use a pro feature and i've said this course is for free options try to use this one it's a rotation blend out and it looks like this you can see how the logo is also affected by it And once you've got that done, right click on your compound clip to undo this compound clip and then add both animations again and see the difference. And once you've got that done, we're ready for the next chapter. Let us now talk a little bit more in depth about text elements. We'll start here again with some footage and under text, we'll have the add text option default. Presets are also available if you're signed in, but we don't do that for our course. Click on the plus sign and you've got that added as an element. You can treat this like a footage, like an audio element and reposition that on the X scale, which will reposition that when it comes to time duration. Then you can hover over this and left click drag to make it longer. In my case, snapping is enabled and I make it as long as my footage. When you select footage, you see the video option, but when you select the text element, it's directly changing to text. You can add animations just like with video. And there are tracking and text to speech options. We'll be talking about that later. Let's get back to text. And there are three options the basic, bubble, and effects. We're going to go over them. Bubble and effects are simple one click options. You just have to download one of these, left click, and you can see it's directly added to this element. It is all about picking something that you like and then left clicking, filter them by commercial. There are some pro options. Be aware of that. Here, for example, would be a free neon effect. As I've said, one click option, easy to apply. But don't forget to click on none if you want to get rid of it. It's going to get stored. Same goes for bubble. Let me download one, maybe this one. It may not change the color of your text. So in this case, white backgrounds and then white font color, white text color. That's not a high contrast. Therefore, we can't see that well anymore. So you may have to change the color right here on the basic to have it actually visible. And here again, click on none to get back to the default. In this box, you can change. Let me make that white. In this box, you can change the text. Let me call that tutorial below. Pick a font. The ones that are installed are visible when you hover over them. The ones that aren't. Don't change the text, you have to download them first via the little icon right next to it. And again, there are some pro options. We'll use this one and then we can scale that up right here via font size. And this is actually the better way to scale up text. Because if you have a low font size and you scale it up, it might skew with the font and make it a little bit blurry. So always size it up using font size and not the scale option for this text element. But you can also left click drag here in this window and resize that. But as I've said, pick the font size option here first. Usual style options here, bold, underline, italic and uppercase, lowercase. And the usual way, the title case. Below you can change the color and then there are options for character and line. Character changes the spacing between the letters and line between lines. So if I press enter and add a second line here and now use this option, you can see that the spacing increases. You can also go to negatives and create overlaps that way. And then there's an alignment option. So the usual stuff for text that you certainly have seen in text editors like Word. Just for explanation. Let me just add some characters here. There is a character limit in this box. So if you have a lot of text, maybe some rolling credits, there's a limit to it. And when you hit the limit, one way to easily get around it is to just add a second text element. So just go back to text, add text defaults, and add a second one. Place it after the first one or make it overlap if you want to have them visible at the same time. And here you can now add more. So this is the way to deal with the character limit. 
Some preset styles are inbuilt. Yet again, one click options, left click on them. That's going to give you this effect. Let's get back to none. Here are the positioning options. And here, as I've said, is the scale. Scale it via font size first. Option for position and alignment. More interesting for us now is a blend. So this affects the overall blend of this element. A stroke. You can stroke your text directly here. I make that red and I increase the thickness. There's also an eyedropper tool. This allows you to sample colors from the original. Just hover over the preview window, then left click, and it's going to get this color. Let me use the street, and now it's grayish. Let me check the box for backgrounds. Here, yet again, I used the color picker. Or I'll make it black. And whenever you open these drop downs for one of these options, you may get more options to adjust it. For example, here quite a lot for the background. Yeah, hate, with, offset. So there are actually a lot of tools in CapCut to adjust text. It certainly isn't as comprehensive. There isn't as much freedom to adjust it compared to Photoshop or even GIMP and Inkscape. So if you have access to photo editors, vector illustration, software applications, use that first and then import your text. But in CapCut itself, you've got quite a selection to choose from. Let me get rid of the background and we'll check the shadow. So it's a simple drop shadow effect. We can adjust opacity, blurriness, distance and angle, and obviously the color. And there's even a text transformation, kind of like an envelope effect. It only allows you a curve effect, but it's better than nothing. 360 degrees to zero in both directions. And this should actually do for most of the text effects that you would want to add to your video project. As I've said, when there's something more complex, then pick Photoshop, GIMP, Inkscape, something like that, and then import your text. For you to practice, I want you to recreate a couple of text elements. We want to make our first one the default text one second long. And when you keep it like this, there is no real option to do that numerically. So you just have to have a calm hand. Hover over the edge, the end of your element, left click, drag, and then watch this turquoise color under the preview window. It should be one zero zero. It's sometimes hard to hit it perfectly, but I actually succeeded. So what I want you to do for the first effect, underline this, use a font that you like, make it yellow, then go to the end, Control C, Control V to copy paste it. That's one second long. In this case, make it black, get rid of the underline, and we want to add a curve, make it 125, go to the end, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, get rid of the curve. Now we want to add a preset style, pick one that you like, I'll go with this. Yet again, to the end, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, get rid of the preset style, keep the white color, and now we'll add a background. I'll go down with the height and increase the width to 45. The next element will get rid of the background. And this time we'll add a glow. Use the second one as the first is 
a pro feature and I'll play around with intensity and range. Don't go too high, I go 60, 45. Next element, we'll uncheck the glow and this time add a shadow. Adjust the values to your liking. I'm going to keep these. Next one, no shadow, but we need a stroke. Use the eyedropper to assemble a color from your preview window. In my case, I make that greenish. And I increase the thickness up to the max to have the sticker effect. So these should be the text elements that I want you to create so that you've got some practice. And then afterwards, we need an inbuilt effect and an inbuilt bubble. So yet again, we'll copy this element. Uncheck the stroke right here. And a bubble, pick one that you like. You have to download it first, so click on the download icon and then it should be automatically applied. And for the final elements, click on none for the bubble. Go to effects, pick one that you like. Yet again, you may have to download this first. I'll go with this. Once you're done doing that, come back for the next chapter. Next up, we're going to add a sticker. Also see this as a button. It has the same name in CapCut. So we'll add some footage. And right here is a stickers option. It works just as it did with text. So what we do, let me open the dropdown first. We pick some from the categories here and the trending, it obviously changes over time. So you don't necessarily have to use the same as I do. Some are pro, keep that in mind. For all of them, some stickers have animations inbuilt, some don't. This one, for example, let me download it. It doesn't have an animation, so it's simply an image, you could say. I click on a plus sign and now we have it here and you can treat this like any other element in a timeline. Let me pick an emoji, there should be an animation somewhere. This one, let me download it. If you want to add it to your footage, click on a plus sign. It needs to be the timeline. Everything else is just a preview. And here I'll left click drag to make it as long as my footage. You can scale it, reposition it. So it works just like an image. In general, you can add animations, but let me pick one that doesn't have an animation. I'll just go back to the one that we had here, this error fail message. Let me use that. I'll resize it. It's selected in the timeline, so it's highlighted. And now I can go to stickers, animation, and there's in, out, and loop. Let me just use a bounce in. And you can see this little line now in the timeline in this element. If I add an out, we have this line now in the out position as well. And you can see the animation is added. It's a simple one click option. Well, what does a simple line mean? Well, this is the duration of the animation. So if we select this element again, we go to in, this is the starting line. You can see here duration 0.5 seconds. And if I make this longer with the slider, the line gets longer in the element. So this is simply the duration of the animation for the specific sticker. And you can adjust that here. Second line in the out position can be adjusted right here via the second numerical option. Third option is for loops. Let me add this pulse effect. Some of these animations in general have more options. Loops, for example, 
they may have a speed option instead of a duration. So I can make this faster or slower. And you can see we now have this line even in center of the element. If you want to get rid of the animation, always click on none. So you have to do that for all. Here, check the line for in. I go to in, select none, and the line is gone. It's fairly easy. I think CapCut has done it in an intuitive way, so that it's very beginner friendly. But I still want you to practice a little bit. I want you to add some footage, then go to stickers, then add subscribe in the search box, confirm via enter, and then pick a subscribe button. I'll just pick the first one, it has a simple animation. You have to download this first, so click on the download icon, then on the plus sign to edit. And subscribe buttons are usually at the end of videos, so I place it here. It pops up, but I want to add an animation, so I make sure it's selected. Then I go to animation in, and I want you to fade it in. Just by clicking on the fade icon, Keep the duration to 0.5 seconds, we're good with this. But I don't like the out. Let's go to out and we'll add maybe like a swipe effect. Let us use side right. And this makes it vanish, so it fades out and moves to the right. But let me make this a bit longer. Keep the duration for both animations, so it's 0.5 seconds. Adding animations to your elements, footage in particular, is very easy in CapCut and is what makes uh, this software so beginner friendly. Let me add an image, footage and audio in my timeline. You can see whatever I select, it's going to get auto detected. So both images and videos are detected as videos you could say. Audio isn't, so this top part here changes a little bit. There is no animation option, but you could see the voice changer as a little bit of an animation category for audio clips. So if you click on that, you will find certain filters and effects that can be added to audio. In the classical animations, this only works on images and videos. So let me delete the audio, we don't need it in this chapter. To the left is an image, to the right, footage. And both have the same options right here when it comes to animation. But obviously, the image doesn't have a speed option. As there is no rolling element in it, you can't adjust the speed. But we have AI stylized now. It's a pro feature, at least as I'm making this video, so we're not going to cover it here. But this is exclusive for images, and it's not available yet for videos. But the animation looks the same, is the same for images and video. You have in, out, and combo options. Let us just add one. It's a simple left click and it gets downloaded. And then you should already see it. If not, left click again. And here in the timeline, you can now see this little line. We have it again. This is for the duration of the specific animation. And we can adjust it right here numerically or using the slider. Same works for video. Let me use the same effect. And again, left click, here's the duration adjustment, and we can see this little line in the element in the timeline. Out works the same way, but there's a different set of animations. So some animations are only available for in, some only for out, and some only for combo. But if you add one of these outs to an existing in, you can now see we have two options to adjust it. Duration on the left is for in, duration on the right is for out. But keep in mind, it's always for the selected element in the timeline. So if you select the video, you can't directly adjust the image animations anymore. Always be careful with this. Combo is usually for an animation in the middle. You can now see we have this middle white line. When we add it to a video, and we can adjust it now from two directions, so which is basically the start and the end point for this combo or animation. A couple of these are pro, but a lot of are totally for free, especially the usual ones like fades and wipes. And this for the most part what you need. And the rest is nice to have. Maybe if you shoot a music video, it's interesting to add a more abstract or more uncommon effect. 
But for social media, regular video editing vlogs, for example, you don't need most of this stuff. Don't mistake this for transitions. We have a specific category for transitions here. So if you want to transition from one clip to another, this would be the option. We're going to cover this in a later chapter. What I want you to do is we'll start fresh, find yourself some footage, add it to the timeline, pick it in an animation, choose one that you like, obviously not a pro one. Let me just use this one and then set the duration to two seconds. Go to out, pick another one, and then set the duration up here to three seconds. Finally, you pick a combo animation and then adjust start and end point so that you only have five seconds in total. And you can also see when you do that, the areas where there is no white line here in the timeline, there will be no animation, so it jumps back to the original. That's something to keep in mind. But what I've given you here is only to practice. Once you've got that done, try the same for an image. So in, out, combo, and you'll see it works the same way. Two of the most used effects in video editing are time-lapse and slow-mo effects. You can easily accomplish that in CapCut. We use this clip right here, simple traffic shot. And when you have that selected, you will find the speed option right here. For now, forget about the curves. You want to adjust it directly here via the slider or numerically. The default is 1.0, which is the original speed and then the duration is whatever your clip has. If we adjust the slider now, watch what happens to the duration. We make this 2x and this cuts our footage in half basically as it speeds it up two times. We only have half the duration and for 5x we only have around 6 seconds. It's a little bit choppy here but don't worry about that. If we would export it, it would be smooth. It's just because of the inbuilt preview window. It's not that fast to render it. But when you have it exported, it should work. For speeding up, you can even go to 100x. It seems like it crashed here, so let me delete this and I import it again. So we'll start with 1x again. If you're wondering what this voice tone change is, it's an inbuilt feature that allows you to adjust inbuilt audio to the new speed. Pretty sure you've heard that when you speed up audio, it sounds like the chipmunks. So you can check this if there's audio in build. We don't have it here, so I'll leave it out. For a slow-mo effect, we'll just go into the other direction. So we'll go to, for example, 0.5x, and this doubles our duration, as it's now half the speed. Whenever you slow down your footage, you might run into trouble. And this depends on how you record your videos. Usually 24 frames per second is enough for the human eye to see it as rolling footage and not individual frames. So most of these clips are shot by default in 24 or 30 frames per second. You can adjust that in your camera when you record the footage. And in this case we only have 30. So if we now cut this duration in half it's going to look choppy. And that's something that you can fix in the pre-editing, so during the recording. Just check your camera settings. But there's also this smooth slow-mo effect in CapCut. You can check this box and it's going to double frames. It helps a little bit, but it's not perfect. But more about that later. First up, what you usually have is to have your footage and then you split it at a certain point and there, there you want to add a time-lapse or slow-mo effect and keep the rest. And you can easily do that using the split tool. B and then select the part where you want to have the time effect added and this will only be applied there. Everything else is left unaffected and has this 1x regular duration. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. A better way to do slow-mo effects and time-lapse effects is actually to use the curves. For us to use it, we can pick these presets, for example bullet, and here you can see the diagram. It's easily explained. On the x-axis you have the time, the duration of your clip. On the y-axis is for the speed. 1x is the default as I've said. 
So in this case, the bullet starts faster at the start and the end, and in the center it slows down rapidly. If I play this, you can see at regular speed, then it speeds up, slows down, speeds up again, and then regular speed. And doing it with curves gives you the option to have smoother transitions between slow-mo and regular speed or time-lapse and regular speed. This is why it's preferable to use that. And I would advise you to use Customized right away, where you start with a baseline of 1.0 and then you can drag these points around and create your manual, your custom effects. Here's a flash out, where it speeds up at the start and then slows down. And here again is our smooth slow-mo, as I've said, it doubles frames. It helps you when you have a low frame rate. Be careful though, depending on your clip size, it might take a lot of processing time. When you work on a real project, I would advise you to use optical flow. It gives you the best quality, but it also takes the longest time for processing. Let me uncheck this here. Simple one-click option, so it's easily applied, but I don't want to waste too much time here. So I uncheck it. One more term to check is what is called ramping. So we'll add our footage yet again, go to speed, curve, and we'll use customized. If you've seen a video editing tutorial on slow motions or time lapses, you may have heard the term ramping. And ramping is exactly what I've explained earlier. We can drag and customize these points up and down. And if I drag this to the left and then bring this down, we would have a down ramp. So it starts at 1x and then gradually goes down at this second point. Here the third point, let me drag it down a little bit to the right. It's just a left click drag, but you have to hit the right spot. And in the end it ramps up to 1x again. And this is usually what a better, a smoother slow motion effect looks like. It takes the regular speed and then gradually goes down and not abruptly. Then you have the slow-mo effect and in the end it gradually gets back up to 1x. And this is just better for the eye, so for the viewer, always try to work with these ramps or you're going to get these choppy effects where abrupt changes of speed happen. Same goes for time lapses, you just have to invert the curve, so we have a ramp up in the start from 1x up to 5x in this case. And in the end from 5x, it gradually goes down, it ramps down to 1x again. So far so good about the principles. Yet again, I want you to work a little bit and actually do that. So we'll start with a clip, pick one that you like, as always. Traffic footage is nice for these effects. Then start on the normal with 1x, should be by default. I want you to speed it up to 5x, then check it, afterwards slow it down to 0.5x, so cut it in half basically. Try to use the smooth slow-mo and check for yourself. The difference, as I've said, it doubles frames and therefore makes it smoother, even if you have a low frame rate. Once you've got that done, use the split tool and split up a part in center and only apply time lapse and slow mo effect to this middle part. And then take care of the curves, go through the presets, but definitely try to understand the ramping. So create a slow mo effect with a down ramp first and an up ramp in the end and then a time lapse which is inverted so up ramp first and then down ramp let us reverse a clip this is easily done in CapCut. it's yet again a one click option we'll use this clip it's a minute long we don't want to reverse the entire thing so i use the split tool i make it like five seconds at the start I pause it here, I split it and delete the rest. I select this clip and when you've got it selected, you can see all of the tools at the top. 
when you deselect it they're gone so just make sure to have it highlighted left click on it and here in between the freeze and the mirror you will find the reverse option just left click on it it's going to take some time to process it and it's going to reverse the entire thing so not just the split so depending on what you import it's going to take some time in this case a minute long clip on my CPU it takes around like 20 seconds I would say are we good now? You get this confirmation message and now you can see the cast drive backwards. So it has successfully reversed it. You can always re-import the original, but in my case it's simply better to press Ctrl Z so that we have the original direction. Then I copy paste, Ctrl C, Ctrl V. And now I reverse the second right here, which is just a copy of the first element. It doesn't need to get processed anymore because that was already done in the background. And now we have regular direction and then the inverse right after it. And this is how you could, for example, create these infinite shots where it goes back and forth all the time. You just copy paste this all the time. You can also left click drag and while you drag you hold alt. So it is going to drag a copy out of it. If you release it, it jumps to the last position. And this is how you can chain these back and forth clips and create footage that's as long as you need to have it. So fairly easy to do in CapCut. What I want you to do is to find yourself a clip, maybe some traffic, some car movement, running, something like this, always good. Let me cut something in the center. Then I want you to copy this, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, reverse the copy, play it to check if everything works. You should have normal direction and then for the second element it should be inversed. Once that works, copy this, hold all drag copies out of there and I want you to have a clip that's around a minute long. So it should always go back and forth, back and forth for an entire minute. Let us create a couple of screenshots and there are two ways to do that in CapCut. So we'll import yet again some footage, simple clip of a city. When this is selected you can see right here a freeze option. If you left click on it this creates what is called a freeze frame. So wherever the slider was in the timeline this is going to get recorded and directly imported as an element. And this is a still frame. You can see that here by default it's 3 seconds long. And you can hover over the edges, left click drag and make this longer or shorter. If you want to position your slider perfectly frame by frame, just use the arrow keys to left and right. And you can see this turquoise number right here for the duration. It gets adjusted step by step, frame by frame. So arrow keys left and right. But this freeze option only works on a specific element. So sometimes you have stuff stacked in your project and you don't want to have a still frame, a freeze frame of an element but of the project. Let me show you what I mean by adding text. I'll just rename this to freeze. Well, let me make this a bit bigger. So we've got it on a rolling clip. And let's say we wanted to export a freeze frame of this position. If we do that, we'll select the element below, click on freeze. And now there's the element. I'll position a slider and you can see we have a freeze frame but only of the clip so the text is missing even though it was on top and this counts for all elements that are stacked so if you have multiple let's say logo you have an animation a button a sticker this wouldn't be recorded by this freeze option so if you want to have stacked elements as a freeze frame as a still frame you need another option and this can be found right here Click on the three lines and there is something called export still frame. Left click on it, a new menu should open. 
The name is by default the name of your project. So in this case, 0330. We call that TUT for tutorial. Click on this button to set the folder where you want to export it to. I'll put it to my desktop so that I can easily find it. Resolution by default 1080p should be fine, but if you need 4K, you can pick that here. Keep in mind that obviously this adjusts the file size, so 4K will be a bigger file than 1080p. Format JPEG or PNG, and then you can import it directly to the project that you're working on or not. If you check this button, let me uncheck it first, and I export. It's on my desktop. And if I now want to use it in this project, I go to media, open my folder, and then just drag and drop it from my desktop. Where is it? Let me find it. It's right here. So 0330tut. And here you can see we have not only the footage, but also the text on top. So everything that was stacked was also recorded by the still frame option. Let me delete it, export it again. And this time I check the button for import. And watch what happens to the media. It gets directly added here so that we can use it. For you to practice, go over this yourself. So import some footage, use the arrow keys to find a good position and then create a freeze frame. Once that is done, maybe add a text, but definitely add something so that you have the stacked order. And then export a still frame and try to import it directly to your project and use it. There is an inbuilt option to add backgrounds to your elements in CapCut when you, for example, use a logo, you use an image, you use footage, whatever you use, you will find as long as it is active in the timeline, obviously, this canvas option right here under Video Basic. You can open a drop down with it and then you will have blur, color and style options. Color is usually what you need to give it a one colored background. The style is about a couple of presets. You can open a drop down here as well. So just expand it right there. You have to download them as always, a couple of pros involved, but most of them are free to use. Let me just download this one. Maybe we'll check it. You can see it's just an inbuilt pattern. It's also a blur option. In this case, it's not a good idea to use it, but I'll show you later using footage. Let's go back to color. Now I import this clip and here we can find the canvas as well. Just scroll down video basic and here it is. Let me change this to 16 by 9. So this is the original size for our footage. You've seen that we could add a background to our logo, to our image. And so the footage, for the footage it's still there, but now for the image, for my logo, it's missing. And this is because it's not on video channel 1 anymore. Even if I drag this footage now from 1 to 2, I will check there is no canvas anymore. So this last option is only available when you have your elements on video channel 1. Here it is again for the image, for the logo. I've had a couple of comments on my channel where people ask me where to find it because they couldn't find it anymore. And this may be the reason why. Whenever you've got elements that aren't on the channel one, canvas is by default not available in CapCut. Let me import a second clip to the channel one. And yet again, here's canvas and for the top one, it's not available. Finally, as I've said, we'll add the blur background here. Let me scale this down. Canvas, drop down, blur. And pretty sure you've seen similar effects, for example, for vertical videos that I use horizontally. So this would be a blur canvas background. For you to try, for you to practice, use an image and footage clip and try to give it a background. Just scale down each and then use this canvas drop down. One of the basic principles to understand in CapCut is the masking. And if you are used to using Photoshop, for example, or GIMP, you know how masks can be used to blend through layers. And the principle is the same in CapCut. But don't worry if you've never heard of that. We'll go over it step by step. 
I will put two clips right here, they have the same size. And if I play this, you can see this vlogging style clip is on top. And below we've got city footage. And if I make the vlogging part invisible, we can see the footage below the city. So we in principle have two layers. And if we select the top one, we can basically cut a hole into it by using a mask. So top one is selected and under video there's the mask option. We for example use horizontal and we have a split screen directly. Here's a feather option, we can rotate it. And then we pick a different one and it becomes more obvious. I use the rectangle. And by default the mask is applied to the layer that is selected. So in our case the vlogging footage. So we can see that inside of the mask. We can easily inverse that right here. It's called reverse, but it inverts this mask. And now you can see the mask, the rectangle has basically cut a hole into the vlogging clip and therefore we can see the clip below. So our city footage is now inside of the mask. Let me flip it. Now the block is inside of the mask. These are just cutout shapes that are given by default, like stars, hearts, stuff like this. A circle and a rectangle is usually what you need. And horizontal is what you need for a simple split screen. You can adjust the position, rotate and the size right here numerically and there's also the feather option. already shown you this, it's this double arrow and it creates a gradual, more like a gradient transition between the mask and the footage. You can adjust all of that in the preview window by left clicking and dragging. Let us get back for example to mirror. Here's the feather. We use a circle. Again here's the feather or we'll left click drag on the double arrows. And you can left click drag to reposition that, resize it and rotate it. Here is a redo option which is simply an undo. So it will return to the default. And a keyframe option. Keyframes are another principle. I'm going to talk about that in a later chapter. Let us forget about that at least for now. And we're going to create a split screen. And I want you to do that yourself with two clips. All that we have to do is we'll undo. To start fresh, we've got both clips in the timeline. The one on top is selected, our vlogging footage. And I want this to be on the left and the city on the right. So I use horizontal, rotate it. We don't need a feather, so I keep that almost to zero. We have a split screen, but you can see both clips aren't that well positioned. The vlogging footage gets cut off or at least the face of the guy and the city footage isn't properly framed. So it would be a good idea to reposition that but if we just left click drag here we are also going to drag the mask. So if we go back to video basic we can left click drag and you can see the mask gets repositioned as well. So we'll have to undo this and add the horizontal yet again. You can see when we edit it's going to be positioned in center of the clip, so not in center of our preview window. Therefore we'll have to left click drag to reposition it. But that should be a way better position for the vlogging clip. I roll it. And you can see he's now properly in frame basically all the time. City footage below doesn't have a mask and therefore repositioning is Way easier here, we can just left click drag on the video basic. And now both clips are well positioned and the split screen looks way nicer. Try to recreate that yourself. As I've said, pick two clips that you like. And if you have to reposition that, use the methods that I've just shown you. Let us go a little bit deeper when it comes to the topic of split screens. We use the same two clips yet again and create this split screen we've done in the last chapter. So we use our mask effect for that. Find the middle position.
Now let's say we want to have kind of like a separator between these two clips. To my knowledge, there is currently not an option to add a line in CapCut directly. So you can import one or you can get around it by using a text element. Just use the default text and then create these underscores until your entire screen is filled. You can adjust it right here, make it thicker, for example, using font size, scaling, the style. And for different fonts, these underscores look a little bit different. So if you want to have a thinner or thicker one, just go through these options. Once that is done, you just have to rotate it 90 degrees and then place it on top like this. You can still change the color. So if you want to make it black, for example, well, let me use red so that we can see it clearly. And as long as this element is now as long as our clips below, the line will be placed on top of it for the entire duration. It's a little bit of a workaround and using a text element might might be a little bit unintuitive, but it's going to be the best option that we've got in CapCut. Let us create a diagonal split screen. This is also a somewhat common effect. You want to go to around this position maybe. But when you do, you need to fix these little edges. So be careful when you reposition your clips. In this case, the one below needs to be a little bit further to the left, so that we don't have a black spot. The one on top needs to be further to the right, because it's being cut off at the top right position here. So there's something to fix. If you want to have a perfectly positioned split screen, it should be around 29 degrees, so minus 29. And now we should have that somewhat well placed at the corners. But when you do that, you can't really reposition your clips without scaling them up. And just as a reminder, if you want to reposition them, always go to Video Basic. When you are under mask, you can only reposition the mask and not the clip. Let me roll it and you can see this would be a diagonal split screen and if you want to add a border it works the same way. So default text element underscores. Rotate it and we've used minus 29 degrees. You can see it for the mask. So we'll have to use the same value for the text element. Just scroll down and here's the rotation option. And then reposition that and I have to make this a little bit bigger. So I add a couple of underscores. Oh, that wasn't well positioned. Let me select that again. I go to text basic. Well, let me make that bigger first. I'll go to text basic and scroll a little bit down until I find the X position. And I can use the arrow keys up and down now to reposition that. But now it should be in the corners. I'll play it. And this would be a diagonal split screen. Finally, you don't just have to use two clips. Let me add a third one. I'll make these two a little bit shorter using B, the split tool. And now I simply apply two masks. One mask for the first one, drag it to the left. Then a mask for the second one, which is then repositioned so that we have a third left on the right for the final clip at the bottom.
you can see it would be a good idea to reposition these clips a little bit. And let us also do that. So video basic, reposition clips, go back to mask, readjust it. The final one, we don't have a mask, so we can just reposition that under video basic. And if you now want to have these separators between the clips, we just need two default text elements, underscores, rotate it 90 degrees, and drag it on top like this. Ctrl C, Ctrl V to copy paste. Position the second one and make both as long as your clips below. I'll play it and you can see this is how easy you can create these split screen effects. For the practice, do it yourself. Create a two video split screen using one of these divider lines, a diagonal split screen and one of these three video split screens. Pick any footage, it's just for practice purposes, and make sure to position these clips well, and then you're ready for the next chapter. Our next effect is kind of like a derivation of what a split screen is, or at least the way we've created it in the last chapter, and it's a simple video and video effect. We we'll start with two clips, I'll make them equally long, go to the top one and you can scale it down, and then you have this square. That you can position top left, top right, wherever. Usually though, if you see YouTube videos, this is actually a circle. So many people use a mask for this top clip. You size it a little bit. And if you now want to reposition it, it's easiest to right click on it and add a compound clip. That way the mask and the clip itself are now one element and we can left click drag and reposition that. Maybe scale it down a little bit further. And this is usually what you see on YouTube when it comes to these commentary videos where people talk in this little window. And same goes for these gaming videos. So gaming streams is how easy you can do that. But many people like to use kind of like a frame for this circle element. Easiest way to achieve that. Let us start clean again. So we'll make this empty. We'll use our commentary video first. We'll add our mask. Then let's do it numerically so that we have a perfect circle. So I use the same values for the size and width and height. Therefore we have a circle and not an ellipse. Maybe 700 is a good value. You can see at some position he leans a little bit too far to the right, but then other right here he leans a little bit more to the left, so I think that's a good position. Now drag it one step above. We'll go to library, background, use white. We know our clip has 19 seconds, so let me make this 20 or uh, let me make that 25. The white one is longer, I can use the split tool now. Snapping is enabled. I get rid of the excess part. Now I use a mask for the white background and here we can go pretty low, you can see that. Even 600 is way too big, let me try. 300 was too small, I'll go higher again to 4. 100, and I think that's good. We now have to reposition it a little bit. I click on this X position and then use the arrow keys to move it a little bit to the left. There might be a good position here. Now select both, right click, create compound clip. Put this one video step, one video chain above, add your second clip. I use the split tool and cut it. Now just reposition it to the right. It's the same effect, but now we have a border if you want to add that. If 
for you to practice. Create these two effects or these two video and video results. First up, make the commentary square and put it maybe to the top right. And second, create this circle with a frame with a border and then put it to the bottom right. You can easily remove a background in CapCut. When I say easily, it's easily done. But the results, they're not that perfect. In many cases, you will have fragments. But the principle is just like with masks. So we want to find a way to get rid, for example, of this part where a woman isn't in frame. And this can be accomplished under cutout. There are currently three options. The auto cutout, which does that automatically for you. Customized. But that doesn't do much or won't help you that much if you don't use it as a pro feature. So we're going to omit that. Let's just check the auto cutout. It says that it only works on humans. I'm going to show you it also works on animals. You can add stroke effects if you want to. And this will distract the viewer a little bit from these fragments that are still in there. Here for example the frame looks fine but at the start you can already see here and it flickers at the bottom part a little bit and this is what I mean. Depending on the footage that you've got, these cutouts aren't perfect. Sometimes they're actually unusable. So these are where the limits, or this is one of the limits of CapCut. In this specific example, I would advise you to look into Premiere Pro. I know it costs you money, but it definitely gives you more freedom to adjust it. But let us get back to CapCut. We have a second way to do it that's free, which is the chroma key. And this is really helpful when you have a plain background like this. So one color, single color, and then a small center animation. We can try the cutout, but it's way better to just use the chroma key. Then you have a color picker, left click on it, and you can sample a color from this preview window, in our case the background color. Then adjust the strength. It's going to add colors to the selection it's going to get cut out from the footage. In this case, let me try something around 40 to 50. You can go a little bit higher, you can see at the bottom here at the feet. Let me even try 60 and that's way better. A shadow is needed in this specific case. But let me try the color picker again and if I hover now at this strength over other colors, you can see how these are being excluded from the footage. So in principle, it picks a color and then tries to get rid of it. Here in this case, we have an animal. As I've said, it's going to detect the animal. So even if it says here only for humans, the auto cutout also works on animals. But it's also going to cut out this little, what is it, a chair where the dog is on. If you want to keep the chair, we can try the chroma key and hope for the best. Let's check the box. I assemble the background color and now I adjust the strength. And here's the limit of the inbuilt chroma key. At some point, it's going to take colors away from what we actually want to keep. In this case, the dog and this chair thing, this tripod with the mount. With this black background, it looks okay. But if I make this a white background, you can clearly see that we have lost a couple of options, a couple of information in the dog. So let us go, for example, to library and I pick a plain white background. You can see we actually have a cutout, but right here in the ears, eyes, the dog is already missing a lot of information and the background shines through. So yet again, limitations of CapCut. Let us try center again. I set it back to 60 by 9 chroma key, assemble the color, increase the strength. 
was around 60 to 70. Let me try this. And here you can see it works totally fine. But it's just because this is a very good example to show you the effect when you work with a green screen. For example, you do streaming. You can certainly try CapCut. As I've said, it's a free option, therefore why not try it? But if there are these small little fragments after you've removed your background, your green screen, you can't get around programs like Premiere Pro, at least for now. Redo practice, find yourself a clip like this. You can just type into Google green screen video and you will find one. When you do it in YouTube and you can download a YouTube video, try that. And you can also find these videos on Paxits. Try to use the auto cutout and try to use the chroma key to understand both features and then you're ready for the next chapter. Let us talk about blending modes and it uses the same principles as the chroma key and the masking. So it tries to filter out certain parts of clips. We use this clip as the bottom part and then I have a little bit of TV dirt glitches and I put this on top. And now we want to add these glitches to the footage below. To do that, we'll make sure that the top one is selected in the timeline and we can go to video basic blend. Make sure the box is checked and then open the drop down. And then you can change the mode. There are a couple of options. What you usually need is overlay, multiply and screen. These are the three big ones. In our case, screen is what we need as this filters out the black colors and this leaves us with the white snow, the TV dirt. And you can see this as a masking effect for a specific color. So yet again, a chroma key. And for this specific effect, we could also go down a little bit with the opacity. And let's quickly create a glitch effect using the split tool here. I press B, cut it a couple of times. I delete these parts here. For the last element, we go to its starting position. And then we click on this little diamond icon here next to opacity. Which is going to start an animation. It creates a keyframe. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more in detail in a future chapter. So don't worry, just follow me step by step. We we'll click on it. It's now turquoise. I go to the end. I click on it again. And now I decrease the opacity fully. We we'll play it. Here are these glitches. Then they disappear. Then they come back. And here they slowly vanish until they're invisible. So this would be a quick glitch effect that you could create using these blending modes. This also works on logos. If you pick, for example, such a logo, it's a PNG. It doesn't have a background, so everything is fine. We can directly use this maybe as a watermark or something. But what if you've got a logo that has a background? Let me import one. This has a white background. It's obviously too big, but I want it here at the bottom right. So scale it down. Now to get rid of the white parts, we'll just use blending modes for this element. But in this case, we don't need screen as it gets rid of the black parts. We need multiply down here and this filters out all the white colors. If we play this now, you can see the background is gone and we only have our logo as a watermark. Blending modes therefore work on footage and on images, but they technically also work on text elements. We simply have to adjust them a little bit. Let us add a default text. And now let me change it to tutorial. I make it bold and let us, for this example, just use a preset style. Maybe this one. And now you will find the blend, but there is no mode here. So for text elements directly, you can't find it. But when we right click and create a compound clip, this is now treated as a video element and we will find the blending modes again. I didn't pick a very good preset style here, but you can see how this works. It blends through certain elements of this text. And for example, an overlay text effect is actually often used. 
let us for example create kind of like a city intro i don't know which city this could be or which state let me just call this iowa i don't know if this would fit but just imagine this would be in iowa and you wanted to introduce this we use a different font to make it a bit bigger no bold style I will just keep it white. I set blending modes. We can't find them here. It's just opacity. So we have to right click, create compound clip. Now we find it and we use the overlay mode. And now we play it. And I'm pretty sure you've seen this effect at least once somewhere on TV or on YouTube. For you to practice, create a text element and make this overlay text effect. Also try to find some glitch effects of TV dirt, TV snow. You can just type this into YouTube and download a video or go to Pexels and then try to create this blending mode effect. Depending on the color that you want to preserve, screen or multiply should be what you need. Let us add a vignette to our footage in CapCut. That's very easy to do. We'll just select our footage in a timeline and then we go to adjustments right here basic and then you scroll down a couple of options here don't worry too much about them we will talk about that later as well we want to find the last option which is simply called vignette if you drag it to the left you get a white vignette and to the right you get a black one in our case let's say 10 to 25 should be a fine value easy to do also works on compound clips Try to do it yourself. As I've said, just select the clip in the timeline and then go to the top where it says adjustment, scroll down to the bottom, and then you're good. In this chapter, I'll explain another one of these basic concepts of video editing. This works almost the same in any of the video editing softwares that I've ever used, and it's the basic principle behind creating animations. For that to work, we need keyframes. I'll just use this clip, some nature footage. I go to the starting position, and here you can see how the elephants are a little bit too far to the right. Would be good to adjust that, and we can do that using keyframes and animations. Keyframes can be created in CapCut by clicking on these diamond icons. So whenever you see them next to a parameter, this means that you can animate this specific parameter. For example, here, rotation, position, scale, even the blend, same goes for audio, so you can animate the volume. Speed, that doesn't work. Animations, they have their inbuilt way of doing things. You've seen that we can adjust the duration for them in an earlier chapter. But adjustments, yet again, here we have these diamond icons next to almost every single parameter. But let us stick to scaling first, and I'll show you the principle. Go to start, click on the diamond icon, move a little bit forward, and you can see there is a diamond icon now in the timeline on this element. If I create a second keyframe, we have a second diamond right here. You can left click drag on them to adjust their position, and you can create as many as you need and want. By using these arrows next to it, you can cycle through them. So left click on them and you can jump from keyframe to keyframe. But we haven't adjusted anything yet, everything is set to 100%. Let us start at the first keyframe with 100. I jump to the second and I scale it up, let's say to 118. And the last one has 100 again. And now we roll it. And what now happens is it's going to animate the scaling. So it gradually gets scaled up from first, from the first keyframe to the second. And then it scales down from the second to the third until we've arrived at 100% again. And this is how you create animations in basically all video editing applications. When you left click drag on these in your timeline on the element, as I've said, you reposition them. And in this case, this would make the scaling up faster and the scaling down slower.
You can right click on this clip and then show the keyframe animation. This gives you just another diagram and here's also a drop down. If you open that you can see the curve. It's a little bit more advanced and I don't want to confuse it too much with these options. For basic animations we don't need that. I just wanted to show you this so that you know that it exists. But in the beginner course, I don't think that this is actually something that we need to talk about in detail. So I right click and I hide the keyframe animation again. We'll get back to the principle. You can also click on these keyframes in the timeline on the element and then press the delete key to get rid of them. Finally, you can obviously delete this element, import a new one and all of the keyframes that we've added are gone as well. So when you delete the element, all keyframes are deleted with it and they're not stored on the element. Let us create yet another scaling animation. I go from 0 to around 140. It scales up. And now it would be good to have this elephant a little bit better framed. So I want to add an animation for position on top. Go to the start, create another keyframe for it. We haven't adjusted it yet, but I go to the second keyframe and now I left click drag and bring the elephant in frame. This has adjusted the X value and at the start it's still zero. So when we play it, it scales up and it moves the frame to the right. So we have two animations running at the same time using the same keyframes. And you can stack them, add in principle as many as you need. If I show them, you can see we actually now have keyframes for X and Y position. The Y position doesn't move. I've set it to zero in both keyframe cases. Or we could in principle now also add a rotation. And this pops up now here in our keyframe animation in the timeline. Let me just add a value of 15 degrees. And now we play it and we have three animations going for X position, rotate and scaling at the same time. Let us get rid of this and start once again. In lots of these nature documentaries, stuff like this, they have inbuilt these kinds of animations where they scale up and adjust the position. And this is actually called the Ken Burns effect. I believe that Ken Burns was one of these more famous documentary makers and he was the one who popularized it. Let us add a couple of keyframes here for scaling and position. Now imagine a documentary over voicing here and this is usually what that looks like. It can also be added to images, to text elements, to absolutely everything, even audio as you've seen in CapCut. Whenever you see the diamond icons, you can add such an animation for the parameter on the specific element. Let me show you just to prove this. We'll go to adjustments and use a hue adjustment. 
I will use a temperature adjustment. Just make sure to open the drop down so that you can see it. And I go very extreme from a warm color to a cold color. Just two keyframes. And you can see how this number gradually moves towards a cold temperature. Let me show you another example where we use the same principle to animate text. So we'll start with our default text element and then I type in a very long sentence. It's way too big for our screen, so we can't read it without scaling it down. And let me actually add a background so that we have a little bit more contrast. I want to make it reddish and I think the height is a little bit too big. So I go down. So now how can we make this a scrolling text? We want to make it scroll from right to left. We need the position for the text element. So make sure it's Select it in the timeline and you should find position and size. We drag this text element outside of the frame. This will adjust the X position. We go to the start of it all in the timeline. Start the animation by clicking on the diamond icon and then memorize or just select and then copy the Y value because we want to have it to be stable in the Y axis. In our case, it's minus 783. So we want to make sure to keep that. As I've said, Ctrl C to copy or just memorize it. We'll go to the end of our clip. Now we'll have to find the text element. So let me just get rid of a number here. We can see it. And now I drag it to the left until it's out of frame. Make sure that the Y value is 783 again, minus 783. But the X now changes from 1400 to around minus 1400. And if I play this, you can see our text now scrolls as it is animated or its position is animated. And we have this typical scrolling text effect. You can go in the opposite direction, top to bottom, whatever you want to have here. For you to practice, I want you to do the same. Create one of these Ken Burns effects that I was talking about. Your scaling position, maybe rotate, and then try to create this scrolling text effect so that you can practice a little bit adding these animations to text. Another key principle of video editing is tracking. In the short clip, we have two moving objects to cars. And if we wanted to add, let me first extract the audio here, I don't need it. And if we wanted to add kind of like an element that follows them, an image or text, we can use the principle of tracking to do that. Let me add a default text. And we'll assume that car, that yellow one, that's me, let's say number 17, something like this. I want to add a background, play a little bit around with the size. And I want to give it rounded corners. To sample the color from the original, from the footage, I use the color picker.
Now we've got the text, but it does move. To do that, we'll select it in the timeline and then there is a tracking option right here. Motion tracking is available in CapCut for free. When you left click on it, you get this rectangle, this box. Just place it on the object. So in our case, the car, whatever you want to track. For now, keep the defaults. We'll go over that later on. Confirm via start. And in this case, you can see it actually follows the motion, the movement of the car very well. And this is because there's high contrast between the car, the, its, its color and the background. But we'll have to reposition our text a little bit. You can easily do that. The tracking is stored in the element. So reposition it, play it. And you can now see how the text follows the car. But you can also see it gets scaled up and down depending on how big or how small the car is in the footage. And this is because of this box here for scaling. You can uncheck that if you want to. Let us check the second car. Um, what can I make this? Let me make this 23 and it's, it's you. We'll give this a background as well. Around the corners with an height will go down. I sent the color from the original. And now we use the same method. So we'll position it somewhat on top of the car, then go to tracking for our text element, motion tracking, reposition the box, resize it a little bit, and then confirm via start, but we don't wanna have the scaling. Direction is for forward and backward. We can just keep it to both. We'll start, and here you can already see it has a problem following it because the contrast isn't high enough. So the background has lots of colors that are in the car as well. And therefore the tracking doesn't work perfectly. This happens depending on the footage that you use and the object that you want to track. When this happens, you can't get around it in CapCut. You just have to do it manually. So we go to none for tracking and then we go back to text basic. And here we need to find the position and size. And then we use our keyframes to animate this by hand. So we are at the start position, find the diamond icon for position, confirm. We are clicking on it and then I use the arrow keys like five or six times forward and then I reposition that in the preview window by hand with a left click drag and this creates more and more keyframes and that's basically what the tracking does automatically. But as I've said, when the contrast is too low, for some objects that won't work and you have to do it manually like this. Let's check the final results and there you go. So these are two ways to create these tracking objects that follow movement. Good idea to always try the inbuilt tracking as it saves you a lot of time. But if that doesn't work, you can't get around it in CapCut. You have to do it manually. Try to do that yourself. Find a good clip, search for racing, for running, something like this. Create, for example, text elements and try it with an image. It works the same way. You can directly create thumbnails in CapCut. So if you don't have access to Photoshop and you don't want to learn a graphic design or photo editing software, you can use CapCut for it. It's not going to give you as many options, but especially for vlogs and stuff like this, it's not bad because you can just position a slider on your footage and then export a still frame. You can also add text elements. Let me pick a different font here. You can download uh, quite a lot of them, many of them are also free.
Let me add a background and I adjust its size and color a little bit. Reposition that. And here you have a simple thumbnail. Let's just say you have a logo somewhere, you want to import an image. Just do so after you've edited your video. Add the logo, replace it maybe, maybe right here. In my case, the color isn't that good for the video background, but you get the idea. I could adjust the color under adjustments. Let me check. I use the HSL. Should be a bluish color, so that I can adjust it a bit. We still don't have enough contrast. Let me play around with the curves so that we can see it. You get the idea for your logo. Pick one that has high contrast with the video background. So a white one would have been better here. But whatever you want to have in your thumbnail, once it's there, just go to these three stripes, click on export still frame. Let me call that thumbnail. I export it to my desktop. I keep the resolution to 1080p and the format to JPEG. We don't need it in our project, so uncheck this box. For YouTube, you don't want to go too low. It's going to get pixelated. But you don't want to go too high either because there's an upload limit. I believe it's two megabytes. So don't make it too high of resolution. And that's already it. There you have your thumbnail. As I've said, if you don't want to learn a graphic design program like GIMP or don't have access to Photoshop, you can easily do that here in CapCut directly. Let us finally export our video. So whatever you've got created, edited, Let's just say we have a default text. Maybe we've added a sticker. How about let me use a free one, not a pro sticker. And I'll reposition it a little bit. Maybe up to here. Let's just say that this is our final edit and we now want to export it. Just click on this button on the top right, export. Change the title, which is the file name. Export to is the folder where you put it. I just put it on my desktop, but you can click here and then pick one. You want to check the box for video exporting. And if the drop down isn't open, open it. Resolution 1080p is enough for YouTube videos. But if it's a short, you can make that 2K as this quickly exported. But if it's like a podcast or something, it's two hours long. 2K and even 4K is going to take you quite a lot of time to get exported. So 1080p is enough for HD quality, at least on YouTube. Bitrate, keep it to recommended. Same goes for the frame rate. It will be automatically adjusted to the footage that you're using by CapCut. Format MP4 and the codec for YouTube should be this H.264. So this is what you need. There's also an option to export audio. In my case, I don't have audio here. And this just means that the audio will be exported separately. If you don't have that checked, that doesn't mean that your video doesn't have audio. This is just to export the audio additionally separately from your video. So if you check this box, you would have an MP3 on top of your MP4 and the MP3 would have the audio, but the MP4 would have the audio as well. It's just that you're going to get two different files then. For the most part, you don't need that. So keep it unchecked. And then there's a pro feature for caption exporting. If you need that, you have to pay at least currently. Once you've got what you want, confirm via export. It's going to take, in my case, only a couple of seconds as it's a short clip of 22 seconds in duration. Once it was processed, you can also see I've got a 16 by 9 video, therefore TikTok wants to generate a 9 by 16 automatically, a short format or a TikTok format. And when you sign in for TikTok or YouTube, you can upload your file directly using CapCut. 
I don't like to do this, to be honest. I like to do it manually. So I don't use share here for TikTok or YouTube. I just can't sit and then do it afterwards manually. Here's our file that we've just exported. So the footage, the fault text on top, and at some point the sticker will pop up. And these are the default settings that at least I would use for exporting videos, especially for YouTube. In this chapter, I'm going to show you how to use templates, but this is not really done in CapCut itself. So the software that you've downloaded to your desktop, it can be done on a website. So CapCut.com has this option in the top menu for templates. Typical social media is here. You can create videos and even photos, images, thumbnails, stuff like this. Let us just go to trending. I will pick. Let's say the first one, whatever it is, sad story it says. And you have to click on it, you see preview. And then when you click on use this template, a new window will pop up. It looks a little bit like CapCut, so we have the same symbols, but it's not like the tool that we have used so far in this course. It's meant for desktop usage. Depending on the template that you've got, you've got more or less elements and you can adjust them. For example, here are 14 text elements. Audio can be adjusted at the bottom. You will find images and the video footage that's included. Let me just use a different template because this is only one footage, one clip below. Maybe this one has more. Let us use that. And you can see here are two images. So sometimes you have more elements at the bottom to adjust. You can replace them by using your own on the media, you upload them. You can use stock photos, stock videos and audio. But it's a little bit of a slimmed down version compared to what we have on our desktop. But you don't have to do much adjustments if you want to use a template anyway. So it's not a bad option for quick results. And if you find a good template, that's the place to go to. It's free to use. You just have to log in to export it. As I've said, you find it on the official homepage, but I'm going to link to it in the video description anyway. But one word of caution, when you use a template, anyone can use it. So you're not going to create unique content by doing that. But for quick results, it's a good solution. In this chapter, I want to go over the basics of color adjustments using CapCut. It's not a video that explains color grading in detail. I've got a full video or a full course planned on that. It's coming in the future. But here we will just go over the adjustment options that exist and I'll go into detail why one adjustment should be a certain way or not. But I will definitely show you how to apply easy effects that look good. At first up, we'll select our clip here and I'll go to adjustments. And then you have four options, basic, HSL, curves, color wheel. And in essence, all of these do the same thing from a different angle. So whatever we do here on the basic, we could also do under the color wheel. But basic is, I think, easiest to understand as it looks like, for example, if you've seen it, a Lightroom adjustment, a camera raw adjustment, you can adjust temperature, hue, saturation, brightness, contrast, highlight, shadows, stuff like this. And it's all this typical slider adjustment and that's directly visible on the preview window. Therefore, it's very intuitive to use. You want to have this box checked to actually see the results. You can uncheck it and then compare it to the original. There's an auto adjustment. If you want to use that undo by clicking on this redo button, all of the adjustments, and then you can simply add this auto adjust. The color match option below is a pro feature, so we're not going to cover it here. But we also have LUTs, and we'll go over that as well in this chapter. In our case, you can combine the auto adjust with your manual adjustments. So if I play around now with brightness and contrast, it's going to be added to the auto adjust and we can still add a warmer temperature. You can save your presets right here, but you have to be signed in for that. 
and this basically creates your own presets, your own LUTs, you could say. Let's quickly go over the other adjustments that I've set. It does the same as the basic, but from a different angle. We have HSL, which stands for Hue Saturation Lightness. Here you can select a specific color and adjust it. From time to time that's helpful. The curves adjustment works the same way as with photos. And on photos you like to create these S curves to add contrast. You could do that here. You could also do that for the specific color channel. It's red, green, blue, RGB. And then we have the color wheel. It's set to primary by default. You can adjust the strength. And then you can target the specific colors for shadow, middle gray, tint, and offset. And here again, you cannot only change the color, the hue, you can also change the brightness and the saturation with these sliders on the left and right. Once again, for a specific color grading tutorial, just subscribe to my channel. It's coming at some point in the future. Now let us talk about the LUTs. These are simple presets that you can overlay over your videos and then add these simple effects. In my case, I already have some in this drop down, and you may not have that. If you've just installed CapCut, it should be empty and only say none. But you can download, for example, Freeloads right here on Shutterstock. You can search for that all over the internet. To so the specific one, I'm going to provide you a link yet again in the video description. And usually you can download them as a zip file, extract it using an unzipper, and then you should have such a folder that contains every single LUT as a cube file. It's usually the file format. Let us go back to CapCut and here under adjustments, but the adjustments up here on the left and not on the right, you will find the LUT option and there's a small import button. Left click on it and then just click on your folder and open all of the cube files. They should automatically be added in this little window right here. For example, blue architecture, I have that here. And once that is done, you can also find it in a drop down. It's relatively easy to add LUTs in CapCut. And whatever you pick here, you can still adjust it afterwards. So let me pick one. Maybe this long beach morning. I'll pick that. And then you can still adjust it manually and play around with these values. There's a third option in CapCut to add very, very easy color effects, and these are the filters. Let's just open that, open the drop down, and you can download them just like effects and transitions and add them to the timeline. They should pop up as an element, just make sure that you make them as long as your footage if you want this filter to be applied to the entire footage. Under Mono, you will find, for example, typical black and white effects. They're called BW in CapCut. And you can see how easy that is. Just download it, click on a plus sign, resize it. 
And then this color effect is added. You can search for specific ones. If you've got something in mind, there's a search option. Type it in, press enter. For you to practice, I want you to download the LUTs that I've linked to or pick different ones that you found on the internet. Try to install them. As I've said, just go to adjustments, LUTs, click on the import function and make sure that your LUT folder is extracted, so unzipped before you try to upload it. Then add a black and white filter and add another color filter that you like. Finally, play a little bit around with the adjustments on the basic and then you're ready for the next chapter. Let me give you a short introduction to filters. We've already used one or two, but there are so many that I thought a specific chapter for it makes sense. Here's a search bar where you can find, or at least try to find specific filters. In essence, you could see them all as LUTs. So these are overlays that are going to change the colors in your footage. There's a drop down where they are categorized. Pro feature for those who have the pro version. We're going to stay away from that for our tutorial. For every filter it works the same way. You pick one then you have to download it first. It's going to get previewed here. And then you can click on the plus sign and put it in the timeline. Sometimes these categories are helpful, sometimes they're not, to be honest. And by the way, all of that works on images as well. Images and video footage is treated here the same way. You know what, let us pick one, but maybe for our footage. Let's add this Barbie filter. And then you can resize it, make it as big as your footage if you want to have it visible all the time. And as long as it's selected in the timeline, you also have the strength option, which is just for the intensity. So the lower you go, the more the original colors come back, the higher you go, the more the filter is applied. And this works for all filters. The search bar sometimes is helpful, but sometimes it isn't. For example, I type in a sepia. I know that there is a sepia filter, 
but for some reason it can't find it. Unfortunately, I forgot in which category it was. Let me try to find it. But here it is under style. So you can see it's actually named Zapier. So if I type it into the search bar, it should find it, but it doesn't. One more thing to add is we can also combine filters. So you can add more than one. And this is going to blend these filters or overlay them. And therefore you will have a different effect due to the combination. And finally, you can use all of the adjustments if you just left click, drag and create a compound clip. So we've got the filters and the footage selected and we can now easily use, for example, temperature to adjust the colors or we'll use the color wheel to do that for the tin, maybe. Go to practice, just play around with these filters, download one, add it to your timeline, resize it, try out the strength, then try to combine a couple of filters, use a compound clip and add further adjustments. Let us take a look at all of the text options a little bit more in detail. We've used them in a couple of effects before, but we didn't go over everything. Let me add a background here as well to the footage so that we have more contrast. And I resize that, 60 by 9 should be fine. You know that we can create text by using the default text right here under Add Text. It's then an element in our timeline, just like the footage or an image. Under Text Basic, you can change the text. Let me make the tutorial. Can pick any of these fonts and there are two ways to resize them under font size and scaling. My advice would be to use the font size first and then the scaling if you have to. Because if you have a low font size and then you use a high scaling, it kind of scales up the font instead of increasing the font size. And depending on the font that you use, that might give you a little bit of a blur and skew with the font. So it's a good idea to play around with font size first. You change the color here, pick one of these swatches if you want, styling, so for bold, underline, italic, there are case options, side case, uppercase, stuff like this, character and line options, let me add a second line, I've already mentioned that in an earlier chapter, alignment options, so if you have a text with multiple lines, you can align them here properly, presets to pick, one click options, easy to do. Always press Ctrl Z if you want to return. As I've mentioned, scaling here, position for X and Y. And rotation. And then there are more alignment options. You can reposition that, scale it up and rotate it in the preview window as well via left click drag. Then we have the blend, and here you can already see we don't have the blending modes. So for text elements that doesn't exist, we can only change the opacity. And let me bring the slider to the footage. And now I go down with the opacity and then it blends. Sometimes you want to have that, it's an often used effect. We can add strokes. We want to have a sticker effect, increase the thickness fully. Smaller strokes are right here on the left.
backgrounds. We've used them, for example, for news ticker, simple slider options. Yet again, opacity, then round the rect angles. We've used it before, hate width. And the offset is for setting it off from the center of the text in the Y and the X axis. Glow is a little bit tricky. When you check it first, there is a pro option active for regular users that's not available. There's only a less intense glow. This one doesn't look that good, even though you can adjust intensity and range. The pro one looks way better. But as I've said, if you want to use the free version, it's not available. Then we have a shadow, but let me move that to the footage yet again. And you can see that it's a simple drop shadow. Nothing too fancy. And finally, there's a curve for curve text. And this goes from 360 to minus 360 degrees. You can save that all as a preset if you have a specific style that you always want to use in your videos, maybe in an intro. Effects and bubbles are pre-installed. One-click options. Some of these have animations inbuilt. Some of them are just, you could say, preset overlays, design overlays. If you click on none now, the last changes will be erased, so you will have the default text back. Let's quickly go to bubble, even though it's called bubble, some are more buttons and not really speech bubbles. And they might skew with the text, might adjust the, the color and even the alignment. You can use a couple of them to create lower thirds if you need that. These are, I would call it, the basic text adjustments. Tracking, we've already talked about that. And text to speech, I'm going to talk about it in the audio chapter. That's coming next. And we also have animations inbuilt for text. Most common effect used is a fade effect. We can use that for in and out. So we have in, out and loop as options and fade in can be found here. Duration for it can be adjusted at the bottom. And if I add a fade out, we can adjust it at the bottom as well. But now it's on the right hand side. So on the left is always for the in animation and on the right always for the out. And there are loops, most of them I would call unusable, but everyone has a different taste, so maybe you like one of them. Bouncing text, for example. Here's wavy text, and this just goes on infinitely. As I've said, I'm not a fan of this, but you do you, it exists, why not try it out? For you to practice, create a stroke text effect, use an inbuilt font, don't just pick the default, try to use something that you like, change the color, then scroll down until you find stroke, check the box, and give it a different color, and then increase the thickness to have the sticker text effect. That way you get a feeling for the options here. And let me show another effect and this uses the blending. To achieve that, let me change the text to overlay and I switch the color back to fully white. 
And now if we scroll down to blend, as I've mentioned, we don't have blending modes, but we need them to create that for our effect. Therefore, we have to right click only on this text element. So the footage is not selected, only the text, and then create a compound clip. This compound clip now only has the text, but it's turned into a video. And we can now find on the video basic the blend, open a drop down, and there are the blending modes. Overlay is what's often used in video effects, but also soft light. But it depends a little bit on the color that you use for a text. For white, most effects or most blending modes won't really work. Same goes for black, but if you've got something in between, try them all out. In my case, soft light and overlay work. And I think that soft light gives us the best effects. So if I would use that in a vlog or something, I would use soft light. Maybe try to recreate that as well. A little secret here, or a little trick, is to turn it into a compound clip. So don't forget doing that. Let me delete this and we'll start fresh with the default text. I resize it. And here we want to add some animations. Try to do that yourself. I use a preset style, this one, just a simple one. Then we go to animation and we use this typewriter effect for the in position and for the out position I want to use kind of like a bounce out. This one should be fine. I readjust the duration to 1.1 and around 1.5. So here it fades in at the start and in the end It'll bounce out. Once you've tried all of that, you're ready for the next chapter. Next up are audio effects. A couple of very useful things in builds in CapCut. Here I have a song and this is usually what a song looks like. So the audio levels are very stable, you could say. So there is not much up and down. Voiceovers look different, so you can see it on the wave form here, what a song is and what isn't. Let us go to speed first and here you have the usual speed adjustments that you know from videos. I have never used it on a voiceover, but you could potentially speed your songs up and your voice. The voice changer. This is a little bit more interesting, I think. You have voice filters, voice characters and speech to song. We'll go over all of that. It basically changes the nature, the tone of your voice, but under basic we'll start with fade in and fade out and you can see that directly applied. A 10 second fade in and fade out is the maximum and you can also left click drag here on the timeline to adjust it. Third adjustment or the big adjustment here is volume. You can left click and then drag up and down on the elements to adjust that manually as well. I'm not so sure if I already talked about it, but when you use voiceovers, you want to use a couple of these boxes for music. You don't just play around with fade in, fade out if you need it and the volume. Well, let me delete that and show you a simple voiceover that I've recorded. It's a simple test audio clip, very short. So we don't want to fade it. Usually you don't want that for voiceovers, but you want to adjust the volume. And then check this box for loudness normalization. This normalizes all of the ups and downs in your audio. So if you don't have access or you don't use an audio editing program, like for example, Audition or Audacity, or is it called Outer City? Whatever it's called, it's this open source alternative to Audition. And if you don't use that to improve and edit your audio, check this box in CapCut for loudness normalization and also the box for noise reduction. This will get rid of these, these background noises. I do that in Audition, in Adobe Audition, so I don't have to use this in CapCut. And here the channels are for left and right channels. You can check that and test it if this improves your audio. It's a simple one-click option. 
Pro features are vocal isolation and enhanced voice, so we're not going to cover this. But if you want to use Pro and if you have access to the paid version, test it out. Especially the enhanced voice works pretty well. Now let's go to the fun part. Here we have the voice filters. Let me just play the audio so that you can hear it and what it sounds like now. This is a test audio to show the inbuilt audio effects in CapCut. Let me add a megaphone effect. This is a test audio to show the inbuilt audio effects in CapCut. And also a deep effect. This is a test audio to show the inbuilt audio effects in CapCut. Depending on what filter you use, you can see you've got different ways to adjust it. For example, intensity, pitch, timbre, something like this. Voice characters are interesting, especially the robot effect. This is a usual effect or the chipmunk effect where the voice is pitched high. Let us add the robot. This is a test audio to show the inbuilt audio effects in AppCard. And again, you can adjust it using the strength slider below. Speech to song, I have never used this to be honest, but you could potentially turn your speech into a song if it has the right length. I would recommend that you try these out. As you've seen, it's very simple to add. Left click on it as long as your audio clip is selected and it will be added. Well, let me show you something that I have uh, not really covered, but that I've mentioned in the last chapter, and that is the text to speech. You can type in your text here. If you've got some text, just copy paste it into this box. For example, you've got a Word document, copy paste it here in CapCut. And then you can use text to speech. And there are different voices. Here again, some are pro, but for example, this male storyteller right here, this is free to use. If you left click on it, it gives you a preview. And then you can confirm via start reading. And it's going to turn whatever text you've put in and whatever text element is here selected into an audio basically read by this typical voice. This is a test to show the inbuilt text to speech Funcitin in CapCut. And here I made a typo, it's obviously function and not funciton, but the text to speech covers even something like this. I think it's a cool feature, it's kind of like an AI voice that's inbuilt in CapCut and available for free. You don't even have to use external solutions for something like this. Let me show you an auto caption effect. We can use, for example, a voiceover or a song. In the case of a song, we can create auto lyrics. For example, for karaoke videos, just go to text, your audio selected down here, auto caption, and there is this auto lyrics function. Make sure to select the right language. Sometimes it's a little bit buggy and it takes a lot of time. And I believe we're in bad luck here. So it freezes right now. If that happens, you have to wait a little bit and then try again. In my case, let me use a different clip, my voiceover, which is shorter, and I show the audio caption, which works the same way. So instead of auto lyrics, we use auto captions. I'll set the source language to English. And there you go, it was able to take the audio and turn it into a text element. It made a typo or it understood something incorrectly, but you can easily go to this field and then Correct that manually, no problem with that. Finally, I want to show you how to beep out parts. Let's just say that there would be a word right here that YouTube doesn't like. For example, the F word or an S word, something like this. YouTube these days is a little bit strict when it comes to swearing. What you do is you use the split tool where the word occurs. Then you go down with the volume for this specific element. Let's assume that it was the F word. And then you can simply go to audio and use a sound effect. Just try a beep sound.
There are a couple, I can't recall which one was the best. But I believe it was the long beep sound voluntary control sound. So let me download that. Click on the plus sign to edit and then overlap it right here. USB for the split tool to cut it again at this position. We don't need the access part, I delete it. And now let me play the audio. This is a test to show the in text to speech Funcitin in CapCut. So this would be how you could beep out a certain word or a certain part of your audio in CapCut very, very quickly. When you practice, try that out yourself. Add a robot voice, add a voice filter, make it deep, maybe a megaphone. Create a beep sound and try to use these auto captions. Maybe you want to try with this song. As I've said, it's a little bit buggy here and there. But definitely try it for auto captions for a voiceover. That should work. Transitions can be a bigger topic in itself. But the way they are done, it's actually pretty simple and quickly done in CapCut. Let us go over a couple of basics and I'll show you a handful of transitions. First one is the most often used transition. Oh, let me grab this properly here. And it's simply called a jump cut transition. So wherever the first clip ends, the second starts and it jumps basically from one footage to the next. This is not a transition that needs you to do anything, but it's the most often used transition in movie history, as far as I can tell, without having proper data, but you've seen that in every movie that you can think of. I've seen it in every TV show and movie that I can think of. It's everywhere. Let me add a third clip right here, and this would now jump from the second to the third. If a jump cut is good or bad, it depends a little bit on the footage that you use, on the perspective, on the framing, the composition, and even on the audio that's underneath it, underlying. But there's a reason why this is the most often used transition. It works, and if it's done well, it's actually the best form of transition. If you want to add something more fancy, we have this transition option right here. You can open a drop down, a couple of categories, and there's a search bar. And again, a couple of pro features that we are going to omit, but everything that's free can be downloaded and then added by clicking on this plus sign. When you add one of these for the first time, it might be that you get a warning message due to the clips that you're using. CapCut will have to duplicate a couple of frames to make the transition work. You usually want that, so just confirm. And I would also advise you to check this box to don't show, don't remind you again because you either confirm and use that or you can't use the transition at all. Now you can see this third element right here. So it's a little gray box and this is the transition. You can select that via a left click and then adjust the duration. And this would be a simple dissolve. We make that very, very slow, almost five seconds. What it does is the first clip kind of vanishes step by step and the second comes in. And that's the way this works. You can delete these transitions by left clicking on them. When they're selected, press the delete key and they're gone. And then you can add the next one. For example, this flash transition. And again, we have this duration option. When you want to add a transition to the spot where the second blends into the third or where there is currently just a jump cut, just select the second or third clip and then add the transition. It should be added there. You can also drag and drop them from this transition window. So whatever you want here, left click, drag it and then drop it on the place where the transition should be. One of the more used transitions are wipe transitions. Here we have wipe right, wipe left, clock wipe. Be careful though, some clips don't really work that well because of the color. Here the second clip is very dark. Let us pick the wipe left and I'll try again. And now it's way better.
Yeah, a couple of options for glitch transitions. Here's the clock wipe. It's very easy to apply transitions in CapCut, yet again, very beginner-friendly and intuitive. Let us add a strobe effect in here. You can see a couple of them are pro yet again, but I believe the first strobe, here it is, it's free. And this is typical flicker light transition, so where the second clip flickers in, it's a typical strobe. So far so good. Try out some yourself. It's always a good idea to go to trending and check because here are often used ones and when something is often used it's usually an indicator for it being interesting and good. But before we end this chapter let me explain to you what an L and a J cut is because this would be right after the jump cut the most often used transitions and here our third clip has an inbuilt audio. And that's important, I right click extract the audio. To create an L and a J cut, we'll cut into the footage right here, but we keep the audio. Let me for example use a split tool at this position, then I delete this small part. And now we have to reposition the audio, you can see it's longer now than our clip. Therefore it's not in sync anymore. We'll just left click drag it up to here. And now if we play this, we have the first clip, then the audio starts, and then the second clip comes. And that is what's being referred to as a J-cut. And it's called a J-cut because the clip and the audio that belongs to it has the J-form, has the form of the letter J. So you go horizontally down and then to the left like it was a J. And in principle it makes the audio of the second clip overlap with the first clip and foreshadows basically the visuals of this clip. And the inverse of that is called an L cut. So let me press Ctrl Z here. I'll get rid of the first clip and I reposition the two remaining ones. Then use the split tool again and I cut a little bit of the end. And here it has the shape of an L. So if we go from top to bottom, there's the visual, and then we could go to the right, and there is its corresponding audio clip. And now the second clip visually foreshadows while the, the audio of the first clip is still running, and this is the nature of an L cut. Jump cuts, J cuts, L cuts, this is what you should definitely know when you want to get into video editing. I would advise you to try that out. Also check the wipe and a couple of distortion and glitch transitions and get yourself familiar with using them in CapCut. Finally let us cover the video effects or at least the basics. There are so many I can't cover them all in a course but we'll go over the principle of using them applying them. By default you have video effects and body effects. It's basically the same but the body effects as the name suggests they target specifically face and body. So these are usually effects that transform humans. Some of them they don't work that well. For example this one didn't really work, the gorilla face. But this one kind of does. Let me try one that definitely works and looks good. I believe it was this one right here. Ah, there you go. It understands what the human is, what, what movement is, and then places this effect behind it and in between the background. Depending on what effect you use, you have different adjustment options. It again, very intuitive, very easy to do.
Be careful of the pro features. You can stack them so you can add more than one at the same time and then layer them on top of one another just like with the filters. Glitch and distortion effects are often used specifically in music videos but also in vlogs. You can find here simple one click solutions. Fuzzy has a lot of adjustments but the one next to it 70s not that many. And here are also a couple of effects inbuilt that you're definitely familiar with. For example, a blur. You can blur out your footage. And here are typical opening and closing effects. Could also call them transitions, but they are listed here in effects. For example, this curtain closing effect. And same way we have opening effects, vertical openings, portrait openings. All of this can be found here under the category opening and endings. There's a fish eye effect. Some are also more, you could say, overlays, for example, these retro effects. And I believe on the vlog there were a couple that are more overlays. Let me check. like TV effects and camcorder effects. So this gives you just a simple graphic as an overlay. One more thing to add before we end it. Let us pick, for example, the blue mosaic. As the name suggests, it's blue. And you can't really change the color of the effect in the effect directly. So this happens with most effects. You can reduce the intensity via filters and play around with size and texture, but there is no way to make it red. At least not in the effect itself, but you can get around it. Just left click and drag over both, right click, create compound clip. Make sure this is active, so select it. And then go to adjustments and use, for example, the color wheel and play around with the tint. And there you go, we were able to recolor this. It's a little bit of a workaround as it's not happening in the effect itself. But this principle basically applies to all effects. Just create a compound clip and then use the adjustments. And this is how you could recolor them. I would recommend that you try it out yourself, make a fisheye effect, play around with the glitches and definitely try out this compound clip adjustment via the cutter wheel. And then we've reached the end of this beginner course. I hope it has given you the basics of video editing using this, I would say, impressive tool for beginners, especially if you consider that it's free. When I started out video editing, it was either using Windows Video 
Maker with basic options or paying directly for Premiere Pro. CapCut's a good tool, use it until you hit its limits. Definitely when you are an aspiring content creator on social media and then once you've made your first couple of bucks, then reinvest it and maybe transition to Premiere Pro for example. If you want to know more, I've got a dedicated CapCut tutorials playlist here on a videography. Check that out, I'm currently adding more videos to it, but there are already more than 100 in this playlist. They are shorter, they take a specific problems and questions and give you specific effects. So if you've got a specific question, check that out first. If you can't find an answer, then leave me a comment. Tell me what you want to have as an effect, what question is there when it comes to using CapCuts and if I can answer it, I'll make a video about it. In general, I hope that this course was helpful. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.